In 1941, Jack Lummis was a 6'3", 200-pound rookie who played both offensive and defensive end for the New York Giants. Born on October 22, 1915, he was the youngest child and only boy born to Laura Francis Lummis and Andrew Jackson Lummis Sr. And from an early age, Jack had earned the reputation as a talented athlete. Jack's talent and determination earned him a scholarship to Baylor University where he was an all-Southwest Conference player in both football and baseball. He excelled in high school, college, and uh, I believe he wanted to just test the limits of how far his athleticism would take him. After a stellar collegiate career at Baylor, Jack had his sights set on being a pro. And in the spring of 1941, this country boy was off to the big city where he signed a uniform player's contract with the New York football giants. Jack would only play in nine games for the Giants, but he quickly earned praise for his talent, determination, and hard work. New York's final game of the regular season was against their crosstown rival, the Brooklyn Dodgers. The date was December the 7th, 1941. I was carrying the ball when they made the announcement that we were at war with Japan and they just bombed Pearl Harbor. And uh, that took the wind out of everybody. Jack played his final game with the Giants in the 1941 NFL Championship game, a 37-9 loss to the Chicago Bears. But with the United States now at war, Jack decided that his love of country far outweighed his passion for sports. His greatest passion was to play football, yet when the war broke out, his calling was to serve his country. On January 30th, 1942, Jack Lummis enlisted in the United States Marine Corps, and he penned a letter to Giants owner, Jack Mara, letting him know of his courageous decision. Dear Jack, I joined the Marines about seven weeks ago and have just now completed my preliminary training here in San Diego. Jack, I would like to take this opportunity to tell you how much I enjoyed playing with the Giants and to thank Duke Wellington, Mr. Mara, and Coach Owen for everything. I'll never forget my rookie year with the Giants. Best of luck this coming season. Yours truly, Jack Lummis. Lummis quickly rose through the military ranks, and by 1944, he was assigned as an executive officer and company commander. A year later, as the fighting intensified, Jack's unit was called into action. And on the morning of February 19, 1945, he landed on Iwo Jima in the first wave of assault troops. Lieutenant Jack Loomis was selected to come up and be and take us through the gorge. He was to come up and dig us out of our foxholes and get us going. The Battle of Iwo Jima was one of the most savage in the history of the Marine Corps. After twice being knocked over by grenade blasts, Lummis continued to lead his men in combat when he stepped on a landmine blowing off both of his legs. But he miraculously pulled himself up, courageously giving orders to his troops. The heroism, unspeakable valor that he displayed on, on that day. Men who served under him loved him. They go anywhere with him. They said so. Lummis died that day on Iwo Jima, and his last words to the attending medic was, I guess the New York Giants have lost the services of a damn good end. Jack was a, a real goer right from the start, and he had football on his mind to his death. And uh, he said the Giants had lost a great end, and we all agreed that they had. There was a lot of tears in the dressing room. Knowing that he had mortal wounds, to go back to think of, of his dream of being with the Giants and uh, what they had lost, and it shows his love of, of sports and his love for the Giants. Andrew Jackson Lummis Jr. gave his life in service to his country on March the 8th, 1945, in the battle for Iwo Jima. After his death, Lummis was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, one of two NFL players ever to be bestowed that distinction. For an individual to sacrifice themselves for others, 
uh, is the most incredible selfless act a human being can make. Uh, and to win the Congressional Medal of Honor and for Jack Lummis to have attained that speaks volumes to who that person is. Ever since he was a young boy, Phil McConkie was a scrappy, undersized football player who had to overcome many obstacles to achieve his football dreams. Because of my size or lack thereof, I couldn't get a scholarship. Um, and my dad and mom just couldn't afford college. And it came down to West Point or Annapolis for me. You know, I love my country and it was an opportunity for me to get a free education and play big time college football and then serve my country afterwards. It was extremely demanding and it was a big challenge. And the idea is to place big time pressure on you to see how much you can handle uh, because it paled in comparison to the types of pressures that you would face as a combat officer in the United States Navy, whether you're driving a ship or flying a plane or leading troops in battle. McConkie went on to become a star at the U.S. Naval Academy. And in the 1978 Holiday Bowl, his final game as a midshipman, he was named most valuable player and led Navy to a thrilling come from behind victory. We were losing 16 to three and staged an epic comeback. And it was just so incredible to be around my teammates uh, that refused to quit and rallied in the fashion that we did. And what an incredible way to go out. You know, after my last game, which I thought was my last game at the Holiday Bowl, I was looking forward to a career in the Navy. I thought, you know, I was gonna go to Pensacola earn my wings of gold, be a Navy pilot, 20 years, 30 years, who knows, you know, in the Navy. And it was a few years into my commitment that I just started wondering what if, you know, if I had the chance, could I have made it? So I decided to go all in when my commitment was over. After five years, I was gonna go try to do this. First thing I did, I was at the Naval Academy. I sought out Steve Belichick, Bill's father, who had been an assistant there for many, many years. And I'll call Bill, he said meaning Belichick, his son, uh, who was just going into his first year as defensive coordinator. And Bill Parcells just got promoted from defensive coordinator to head coach. So through that connection, signed with the Giants and you know, went to training camp. In 1985, Phil McConkie would have his best season with the New York Giants. McConkie would have career highs in receptions and punt return yardage. The big thing for me was my ability to catch punts. And I think that pressure and that being uncomfortable kind of really honed my focus. In Super Bowl 21 in Pasadena, McConkie raced into the stadium with his signature pregame towel-waving dash down the sideline that sent Giants fans into a frenzy. I had a lot of energy, a lot of pent-up energy, and I just couldn't wait to, you know, bust out of that tunnel. And as soon as they released us, I usually just would sprint to the other end of the field and just whipping the towel up, and it was bedlam. Whatever I could do to help my team, and if that enthusiasm and that fire pumped us up, you know, so be it. In the second half, McConkie dazzled the crowd with two iconic pass receptions. Sims is looking way down, fails. He's got a receiver, complete, down to the 10, five, touchdown, I believe. That's the one. Mark at the one. It was surreal because I could see every rotation on the ball as it spun towards me. And then when I caught it and headed upfield, I thought I was going to get in. And then Mark Haynes, who was a former teammate who was with the, the Broncos, came in from my right and I tried to hurdle him from the five yard line. A flea flicker. And I was that close. Um, didn't know that I'd get another chance the next series. As fate would have it, in the fourth quarter, McConkie's dream would come true with a little help from his friend and giant teammate, Mark Bavaro. It is complete, yes, he hung on to the ball. Bavaro hung on to the ball, McConkie came down with it, off his fingertips. Sims delivered it right between his hands, balls deflecting, it's tumbling end over end, down, and just snatched it, you know, a foot or so from the ground, and again, I, I was ecstatic. I was literally out of my mind, I was, I was somewhere else. It was an out-of-body experience is what it was. McConkie's NFL career ended in 1989. In his five seasons with New York, Phil would become one of the most beloved Giants of his era. And decades later, he still feels that strong bond to the Big Blue family. All of my teammates understood for us to do something great, you know, we have to be a team. 
And in the military, it's the same thing. You don't succeed, you don't accomplish anything unless you're a team. That's leadership. You know, that's Giants football. That's part of, you know, the fabric of what makes this franchise and this team so great. Alfred Charles Blozes was a fifth round pick of the New York Giants in the 1942 NFL Draft. He was an All-American tackle out of Georgetown and attended William Dickinson High School in Jersey City, New Jersey, who quickly emerged as a giant among giants. Al was 6'6", 250 pounds. He was an uh, incredible specimen of a human being. He was a three-sport athlete at Dickinson, lettering in football, basketball, and track, where he set several state and national records at shot put before graduating in 1938. He went on to attend Georgetown University, where he once again excelled at both football and the shot put. Only now, he was setting world records. Al Blosius was the greatest shot putter in the world at the time. He would have been an Olympian uh, had he not canceled the Olympics in 1940, and would have been the odds-on favorite to win the gold medal. Blosius was a star in both offense and defense. And in 1941, he led the Hoya football team to its only bowl appearance in school history. Losis would make an immediate impact at offensive tackle for the Giants in 1942 and was named an All-Star. And in 1943, he was named First Team All-Pro. Losis was becoming a force on the football field, but his passion was to serve his country on the World War II battlefield. But there was just one problem. Initially, when he tried to volunteer for the uh, armed services, the Army, he was declined because he was too big. Uh, they actually stated he wouldn't be able to fit in uniforms. The Army rejected him because of his size. And he fought and he fought and he fought to get in. And they finally accepted him. In 1944, Blosis was assigned to officer's training school and came out a second lieutenant. He also played in two more games for the Giants that year, including the 1944 NFL Championship game against the Green Bay Packers. It would be the last time Blosis would wear a football uniform. He gave up his football career for his country. He actually told my father, just to uh, take care of the family, he says, uh, I, I don't think I'll be coming back. On January 31st, 1945, Blosis was killed on a battlefield in France. Two of his men were lost in a blizzard. Blosis went searching for them and never returned. His name is on one of those thousands and thousands of white crosses over there. On that particular day, he was doing in his heart what he felt was right and what he felt was best, and he tried to save his fellow brother. Al was named to the 1940s NFL All-Decade Team, and his number 32 jersey is one of only 11 numbers all-time retired by the Giants. If Al Blosius had come out of the war and come back and played football again, he would have become the greatest lineman who ever lived. There's only one Alblosis. He's one of a kind. Before he was the star defensive back for the New York football giants in the 1950s, Emlyn Lewis Tennell grew up in the Philadelphia suburb of Radnor, Pennsylvania, just eight miles northwest of the city. Emlyn Tennell was a true hidden figure. I mean, nobody actually knew that much about him except the people from his home, Garrett Hill, Radnor Township. After starring at halfback for Radnor High School in the early 1940s, Emlyn would go on to attend college and play football at Toledo University in Ohio. Despite a potential career-ending neck injury in his freshman year, Emlyn would recover, and with a strong desire to serve his country in World War II, he enlisted in the U.S. Coast Guard in the spring of 1943. Stationed aboard the USS Edmund in the South Pacific, the stories of Tennell's bravery and heroics have come to light over time. He was on a destroyer that got torpedoed by the Japanese. He dove down 10 stories into the water and he saved the fella. 10 years ago, I stumbled upon Emlyn Tennell and his story, and really we didn't know about what his contributions were in the Coast Guard. So they went back and they looked at his record, and in his record, they actually found a citation basically for a silver life-saving medal for a different incident in 1946 and found out that he had saved a shipmate's life on board the USS Edaman and he put him out with his own hands. He obviously burned himself. So a silver life-saving medal is one of the highest awards that can be given to 
a Coast Guard person, for putting themselves in peril in order to save someone else's life. And that's exactly what he did. You know, he is an amazing piece of our history. Saving two lives, guardian ethos, honor, respect, devotion to duty, he hits all the marks. Following the war, Emlin finished out his collegiate career playing two seasons at the University of Iowa. Undrafted out of college, Emlin's legend would continue to grow with the story of him hitchhiking to the polo grounds in New York, where he walked into the Giants' offices and asked Jack Mara for a tryout. You know, Emlin just, he showed up one day. Emlin never had a driver's license, and so he hitchhiked everywhere, but they literally knew nothing about Emlin. Um, until he showed up and, and asked for the tryout. And sure enough, in 1948, Emlyn Tunnell became the first African-American to suit up for Big Blue, bursting onto the scene as the Giants' new punt return specialist and defensive back. Drops into the waiting arms of Emlyn Tunnell, and he does what the New York fans have been hoping for all afternoon, adding another brilliant run back to his record and a touchdown to the New York side of the scoreboard. It's unfortunate that you know, the player of today and the fan of today has really never even heard of M1 Tunnell because when he was a player back then, he was a combination of Ed Reed and uh, Deion Sanders. He was ahead of his time. Earning the nickname Offense on Defense, Emlin would be named to seven straight Pro Bowls and he helped lead Big Blue to the 1956 NFL Championship. In 1959, Tunnell would join Vince Lombardi in Green Bay playing three seasons with the Packers and helping them win the 1961 NFL Championship. Following his retirement, Tunnell returned to New York as an assistant coach and was part of the Giants coaching staff for over 10 years. Very kicking a 40-yard field, though, so that's a long way. He ain't going to rush him, are you? No, no. A true pioneer, in 1967, he became the first African-American to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame being the first African-American to play for the Giants and the first one to go into the Hall of Fame as a defensive player was pretty incredible. Over 50 years later, Emlin's legend still lives on and in June of 2018, Tunnell's legacy would be forever cemented when his hometown of Radnor, Pennsylvania honored him with the creation of a statue at the Delaware County Sports Legends Museum. He was born and raised here, and it's time people know who Emlyn Tunnell is and uh, remember him not only as a great athlete, but as an, a war hero and an, a, just an amazing person, a teacher, a coach. So, you know, I hope this will bring awareness to his life and continue to inspire people. We think that Emlyn Tunnell should be up there with, in the Mount Rushmore of professional athletes, just like Jackie Robinson, uh, Bill Russell and it transcends race. We're talking about the first defensive player to ever be inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame. We're talking about the Coast Guard naming a, a cutter ship after him. So we're very proud of Emlyn Tunnell, very proud he's from Delaware County, and we think that uh, this is gonna be nothing but a celebration of his life, and it'd be hard pressed to find somebody that's more deserving than Emlyn Tunnell. Emlyn Tunnell still ranks second all time in the NFL with 79 interceptions. He made the Pro Bowl nine times in his career and won two NFL championships. In 2010, Big Blue would pay tribute by inducting him into the inaugural class of the Giants Ring of Honor. He was a great football player, a great man, and a great American. <laughs>